Great. So uh, we have Brian Link here to talk about uh, scaling Agile without being safe and the Scaling Manifesto. Um, we also have a couple of the authors of the Scaling Manifesto here. Um, I think Andrew Jarding and Dane Weber. I saw both of you. I'm not sure if anyone else is here, but um, it's great to have you here. And hopefully uh, there's a little bit of conversation at, uh, towards the end here. And you can jump in with some of your thoughts about where it came from and, and such. Um, so Brian is a coach at Dog. Um, I've been working with Brian for about two years now, um, and I will let him do the rest of his introduction. Awesome. Thanks. Um, cool. Um, well, again, thanks, Kevin. Um, my name is Brian Link, and we're trying to keep this a little bit casual today. I had this um, kind of idea brewing, and then just like Kevin called out uh, Ken to talk him into speaking at a future event tonight. Kevin did that to me a month ago. And so he's like, Hey, why don't you talk, talk about scaling agile or something? I'm like, all right. So I'm really excited about the work that we're doing at M and T about scaling. And it's gotten me thinking a lot about, um, how the world is treating scaling. And so, um, the part that I really wanted to focus on is having sort of a framework to guide your thinking about scaling. And I only know of a couple of things that do that really well. A lot of people jump straight to frameworks. And so you see here in my picture here, more of this and that uh, picture of the Matterhorn actually comes from the scalingmanifesto.org uh, that Kevin just mentioned. Some of the authors are here tonight. I wanna to talk a, little, a bit about what that means, uh, but I'm gonna provide a bunch of context first. And um, I'm not gonna beat up on safe, as provocative as the title <laughs> might be. If you were here for, to hear me beat up safe tonight, uh, you might be disappointed. Uh, there's plenty of good things that are in safe. Um, the, the, the warning or caution that most agile coaches will tell you is that jumping to a full-on framework, especially one as heavy as scaled agile, without actually thinking about or having a plan about how to grow organically or how to address the problems in a sort of incremental way using agile to implement larger agile for example um, can lead you down a pretty ugly path so um, i, I want to tell just a little bit about my background for a second this is not meant to be you know my ego hey here's my business card i'm going to hand it to you i haven't handed out business cards in a year so there's your virtual one um, but the reason i put this cheesy slide together was to a say hi i'm an agile coach I came to this job through kind of a technical path. Um, I haven't programmed in quite a year, a number of years, but I started off as a software consultant at Cambridge Technology Partners right out of college, went to Boston University, and I was a programmer for many, many years and uh, led to being a software engineer, uh, engineering manager, and uh, spent sort of most of the growth of my career as a startup chief technology officer. And so I bounced around about three or four different startups where I basically led the whole technology team and had to wear the product owner hat, had to wear the scrum master hat, had to teach everybody agile and keep the train on the tracks, the whole company uh, kind of pulling and coaching the executive team as well. And so what I wanted to do is I want to draw some analogies to some of my experiences from working in the startup world and how it's helped me kind of think about some of these things as I've worked at the last couple of companies. Um, I helped lead uh, a fairly sizable transformation at Dell when they were building a software organization, which they've since spun out. Um, and here in Columbus, um, there's a software company called um, CAS, part of the American Chemical Society. They have a database with literally every single patent journal piece of chemistry information on the planet in one place in a gigantic real-time database. Really cool company to work for. Um, I helped about 60 teams become agile there as the sort of lead portfolio agile guy. And then for the last couple of years, two plus years, I've been working with Lean Dog at the client MNT. Many of you are here on the call today. Um, and doing a lot of the same kinds of things, learning similar lessons, helping kind of evolve organically. But if I take you back to um, this sort of root of what if you just have one team? If you have one team, do you have to scale? Do you really have to use all the scaling constructs? 
So this is a you know nine person team, for example, um, and maybe you recognize the balance breakthrough model here on the left. I like to think of it generically as just like people, process, and technology stuff, right? And if you were working at a startup and you had a blue scrum master and a green product owner and a whole bunch of um, technologists with different skill sets, there's some stuff that you just wouldn't need to do. Can anyone think of something and shout it out? Why wouldn't you need to do certain scaling stuff with nine people? Anyone? Anyone? You don't need multiple levels of product owners. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't have hierarchies to deal with. And guess what? If you got nine people, whether you're working remotely or in, in one location, you could just talk to each other, right? You could solve most of the problems through just having a conversation simply with your colleagues. And a lot of the startups I worked with, gosh, we moved really fast and we, you know, broke things as our Facebook friends said, and we did all kinds of things really quickly because we were one simple team. But we did in fact need a leadership team. We couldn't solve all of our problems. We couldn't do all of the stuff that a startup needs to do. So things like having a company vision. Well, guess what? My little gray box is on the right here. You probably have a founder, the F and the CEO, helping to sort of set the stage or the direction of where the company is going. You probably have people dedicated to your product vision. What are we going to build and why, right? The founder might be part of that. Might even hire somebody that's a VP of product over time to help kind of define that and hone that um, as the company grows. Somebody's probably in charge of customer experience, understanding the journey. You might have to hire a chief marketing officer, somebody to really articulate what that end-to-end -end customer experience is. Um, you'll have a CTO, someone like me that was working with these young startups, who owns the technology vision. Are you using the right tools? Are we you know, um, in the right place of our industry? Dealing with different architecture ramifications, hiring the right people to solve the right technical problems, and collaborating with um, uh, a VP of engineering who might own the architecture, dealing with the architectural runway, and getting into the weeds potentially, and actually gluing pieces of the system together, um, as well as managing the team of technologists, right? So if the VP of engineering might be the HR manager of a lot of the team members in this little microcosm of a agile environment. You may also have a COO or somebody who's in charge of DevOps, uh, maybe owns the production environment, maybe is in charge of helping to build forms of automation to push code into production, do red, blue, green deployments, and deal with keeping the team productive through using automation. Um, I'll do a lot of hand waving in um, this talk tonight about budget and financials, but maybe in the startup you got a VC, a CFO, and the CEO is constantly uh, working on raising money in a startup. Um, the CEO um, holds kind of another really important role though. Um, as you grow and you think about a larger organization, there's an analogy here where um, all of the stakeholders, internal and external, that have a vested interest in the success of the product um, probably end up getting filtered somehow through uh, perhaps a VP of product, but likely um, a, a CEO. And so all these things that a startup does could maybe be translated into a set of questions, things you're familiar with, um, that um, the product team has to deal with, get some sort of assistance on. How are they gonna handle obstacles? Maybe deal with changing priorities. Um, the, what's the plan for the future? How are they gonna incorporate customer feedback? Um, even the process itself of getting things done, being more agile, uh, managing the risk, dealing with dependencies, or communicating issues they have. And so, as I just covered, even if you're a startup team, you're fully self-reliant, you have all the skills that you think you need to build the product, you need some sort of a leadership team to help you deal with all these kinds of things. Now, what if you have 10 teams? All of a sudden, the teams of teams introducing a lot of, introduces a lot of other complexities. Um, more of the same types of challenges, um, just a lot more of it, right? So now you can't easily just chit chat with your other eight team members and figure stuff out. You got 90 people in this instance to deal with solving problems. It's not nearly as easy as having just that one small team. So what do you do? How do you solve these kinds of problems? This is kind of the, the nut of what scaling agile helps to deal with. Uh, you install safe, right? No, you, <laughs> you, um, if this is the answer, um, 
maybe you're jumping to conclusions. Now, um, I told you I wasn't going to beat up on safe too much, but uh, there are some really good things here. Um, I encourage people to read the lean agile leadership section. Um, you know, they talk about teams of teams in a healthy way. Um, I even don't mind a lot of the stuff that's in PI planning, um, the idea of integrating with an enterprise architecture. Um, there's lots of really good things here. Um, we just kind of caution people to jump to conclusions too quickly before they're quite ready. So how do you actually think about proceeding um, as soon as you at a company start to need to scale? And guess what? A lot of big companies start with just one team that's agile. And that team needs to figure out how to do all those other things, solve all those same problems. So um, let me take us all the way back to sort of the manifesto, because this is the building block of anything and everything that you've ever learned about agile, right? And these four value statements form a framework for thinking about being agile. Um, and of course, they're described in more detail by the 12 principles. You guys have all seen this stuff before, but it's, I think of it as the philosophy, right? The ground rules of how to guide your thinking about being agile. Um, not doing agile, being agile. Um, and so don't forget the first and last lines, right? It's important that we do this through doing it. You have to actually help others try to do it as you learn it. Um, and that it's not that these old ways of thinking on the right are um, not important. Um, we just wanna favor these ones on the left about the way that we think about um, conversations building things to learn what works, um, getting feedback sooner, talking to customers so we know what matters and expect things to change all the time instead of just blindly following a plan. So if I pause for a second and think, okay, so if you start with this kernel of four value statements that serve this whole world of Agile, what problems is safe solving? Um, you can ignore all the words in the slide. I don't intend to read it to you. All I'm really trying to say here is that there are problems inside of the safe, um, uh, uh, there's solutions inside of the safe uh, structure that help deal with the impediments, the product management problems, having a vision and roadmaps, dealing with the customer experience, dealing with product ownerships. There's aspects, all of that that are solved. But what safe doesn't do for you is kind of explain the impetus for why you're doing these things. So that's what I wanna get us back to in a second here. Um, so whether you're a startup or a big company, you still need to do all the same kinds of things. We need to address the similar challenges and everybody starts with that one kernel and then they try to grow. So my suggestion is we find a way to think about scaling slightly differently, building upon that mindset and yet thinking about the scaling process being organic itself. And so the scaling manifesto, um, if you haven't seen this or heard of it, um, you should absolutely go read it, but I'm gonna actually show you it word for word for a second. Um, so what does it mean to scale agile? And like uh, the, the site says here, scalingmanifesto.org, um, the definition's great, right? Agility at scale is the ability for a bunch of teams to work together, there's a common purpose in some sort of a highly dynamic, and you can think political and toxic if you want, in any kind of highly dynamic environment, right? And it may involve scaling up, making bigger teams to solve bigger problems, or it may involve scaling out, using multiple teams in a creative way to deal with these interrelationships and connections that are necessary. So then they're really good about the way they describe this, right? The concepts require an evolutionary approach to align to the work that's flexible, building upon autonomous teams to organize the objectives through continuous inspection and adaption. So you need feedback loops, you need the culture of product teams, and they don't want this to replace, but to build upon the foundation set by the original manifesto. Um, it's also, much like the manifesto itself, even though that word software is in there, I think we all know that if you ask some of the um, actual folks that wrote the original Agile manifesto, if they could change one thing, they'd change that word software to product or value or something that was a lot more um, broader in terms of its ramifications. And the same thing's true here of the scaling manifesto. So here's my reformatting of the exact scaling manifesto that you'll find on the website. In order to help organizations become more agile, let's value these things. Let's have a shared vision over aligned processes. We're talking about inspiring teams of teams, the right level of vision, instead of maybe forcing alignment through process standards. 
um, let's assume there's going to be an organic way to grow over some sort of conforming to a predefined structure, the hierarchy mindset that's been instilled in so many big companies. Let's focus on how to actually benefit the company with every decision, with, with every act of what we do. Um, we, we're not building a process to have a beautiful process. We're building a process so we can accomplish the work. And so that's what I interpret this statement to mean is that if you have to make a choice about building really awesome, high performing teams, maybe make sure you're still doing the right thing for the company. Let's value building a high performing organization. And this last one is reinforcing this idea that you need to have a team centered, team empowered accountability and responsibility as opposed to just a bunch of CYA organizational policies and that's the way we've always done it type of mentality. Now, there's something about scaling that I think everyone has to recognize is that every transformation takes years. And so we have to still recognize that parts of the organization are gonna be moving faster than others, adopting more principles and practices than others. And so we have to still value the things on the right here because we're gonna have to live and coexist with them. But where we can, and however much we can possibly do it, we should favor these things on the left more. I really love the parallelism here between um, the original manifesto and the scaling manifesto. And I think of it again as just philosophy, a way to think about this, a what context about how you should consider scaling in your organization. And so if you think about um, one team, and we think about these nine teams, and you have to do all the same things, how do you solve those problems? Um, the way to do it, um, if I'm kind of interpreting and then sort of translating some of what I think I've learned from just reading the manifesto, um, is that you sort of have to start with understanding where you are. So assess your existing products and solutions and think about your actual dependencies. If you're just gluing teams together for no good reason, that's not gonna help you scale. But to find the common mission, the common product solution, the common customer segment, and form those teams of teams in a, in a reasonable and deliberate way, then you can have this sort of focus that helps you scale. So let's form small teams of teams. Um, every company is already doing this to some degree, and I think they lose this sense of, um, are you building the right solution for the right reason? So let's form our teams of teams purposefully. Now, no matter what you do, you have a team of like 50 people or something in this case, um, you still are gonna need some sort of a lightweight leadership team. And so let's just assume that that's true. And then what I want to focus on here is that that same Venn diagram of the people process technology and the things that a small startup has to solve, it's the same thing that a team of teams has to solve. And so you can think of these areas of focus like the product, the agile process, managing of the people, the technology, and the customer centricity. And if I translate that into my Venn diagram again, it's people process technology plus product and stakeholders. So I might actually put some, and these are my names, they're not part of SAFE or Scaled Agile. This is just sort of the way that I'm interpreting the function of what I think you should probably need. And again, sort of the guidelines for how you might think about scaling and why scale at all. You should probably think about having maybe a product manager, somebody who's in charge of the business and the vision and connecting it to strategy and all those things. Think of these people as the lens through which you're supporting these things bigger from the top of the organization. Um, maybe you have an agile coach that's the person helping to uh, reinforce the mindsets and the ways of thinking and the new ways of working. A delivery manager, which is a fancy name that no one else uses but me, I think, about um, somebody who's the HR manager, the people that the people report to, who also have some level of responsibility of making sure things are getting done and connected to the outside um, edges of the organization. You need some sort of a technology architect, and I don't care whether you call them a solution architect or enterprise architect or just a technical architect, somebody to help keep that technology vision to complement the business vision for this team of teams. And then of course, somebody be connected to the customer journey. What's the actual um, experience of the end-to-end -end customer and be that lens to help the team stay focused from that perspective. So if I just take one of these team of teams and think about the context of the organization, we're gonna to have to admit that we have more layers of management than just that. There's some layer of middle managers and some layer of executives almost anywhere you go at a decent sized company. So 
how do we actually treat these people in this um, team of teams leadership roles um, as the lens through which some of these important guidelines about how you think about scaling? How should they work? So again, the same questions, you might recognize this list. Who's gonna deal with this? Who's gonna deal with that? How do we solve these problems? How do we solve those problems? Let's talk about some of these things in the context uh, very specifically of the scaling manifesto. And so the first one, vision over aligned processes. What do we mean by that? Um, you might think it uh, involves about taking this vision, the big picture company vision, and um, it has to flow from the top to the bottom. It should be inspired by the big picture uh, defined somewhere by executives, middle managers, somehow. It needs to flow to the teams and be translated so that product manager has a very important role. And in order for those vision statements to actually resonate, we need to have some level of trust and responsibility. We have to have a team-centric mindset that shares that accountability and those teams have to have the right level of psychological safety to then share when things aren't going well, when they're not able to solve the problems in a timely way or whatever might go wrong in the process of reflecting and executing against that vision. Now, hopefully a company has some sort of objectives and key results. Um, and you know you can do that in a number of different ways. It doesn't have to be the defined Jonathan Doerr measure what matters, objectives and key results. But I think it's great if you do. Um, some level of high level executive board or initiatives so that there's agile and transparency and things at all layers in the organization. Let's assume that there's some level of translation through the divisions or the different departments of the company. And all of a sudden it's a little bit easier to understand what my little corner of the world needs to do to accomplish and be a part of and connect with the big picture of the company. So that's a shared vision. If you think about organic growth and how do we actually deal with that as opposed to dealing with our old ways of having a predefined structure. Um, a lot of the context that you might see in our Agile universe is around building communities of practice. Um, and you can do this a lot of different ways. Um, and I don't care if you're talking about Spotify strategies of building tribes that go you know, orthogonally slice through the various teams of teams, or you just have a you know, scrum master community of practice. Um, somewhere, somehow people can take those things they're passionate about, their skills, their role, their focus in the world for the company. Maybe it's just about Agile, maybe it's various flavors of software engineering, maybe you got a bunch of JavaScript developers and they need a community to share and build their own expertise in. This is a way that you can help the company grow organically by creating the right level of focus around the skill sets that matter. And then what's gonna happen? It's gonna generate conversation. People are gonna learn from each other and they're gonna go, hey, why are we doing these things this way? Maybe we should change the way we think about X. Scrum masters shouldn't be on more than two teams or whatever, right? Somebody's gonna have to help make those things part of maybe a new policy or a new way of thinking and have somebody in a position of authority. Unfortunately, we have to deal with that still to some degree. Maybe you have centers of excellence. So somebody can say on behalf of the whole company sponsored by this executive, we shall not have scrum masters on three teams anymore. Great. That was an awesome idea. It grew organically out of a community of practice, solidified through some form of leadership in the company. And now everyone knows about it because we've communicated that across all the different teams. The third one that I wanted to focus on here is the high performing organization. Um, when I first heard Paul Booz, one of the authors of the manifesto, describe the scaling manifesto, he said this one was probably the most controversial to write down. And I think it's because there's so much focus in our agile universe about building really awesome teams. And building teams has this really, really like attractive, like learning strategy like it's what everyone can connect with because like i'm on a team i get it i understand this role and it's um it's part of what you see a lot out there in the world but if you really were to think about what's the right thing to do building awesome teams doesn't make your company make any more money right or it doesn't make your customers happier or doesn't solve the problems your nonprofit's trying to address or whatever, right? So what do we need to do is figure out a way to take again the inspiration from leadership through the lens of this team to say, okay, our execs, 
our objectives, our vision, all the things we've talked about so far need to express the intent and purpose of what we're trying to accomplish. And then the teams have to have the right level of empowerment, the right level of uh, freedom and experimentation, right? To learn through failure. And we're talking about small failures, not the 12 month launch and die failures, but the ones that they can learn, inspect and adapt and the feedback loops that actually help them solve problems day to day. And if the right people in these leadership roles have that level of authority to make decisions for the good of the company, then they can make those hard decisions about what to say no to into the backlog, about what to actually be working on to achieve the right things for the greater purpose of the company. And so it's all based on some of these cultural things that get pushed down to the team level. Um, so making good product decisions will benefit the company if we allow these teams to do that. The last one is about creating, again, more of the team culture and creating the right level of responsibility instead of sort of old ways of thinking or the way that we've always done things or our existing organizational policies. And so again, you're gonna have this um, inspiration and vision and growth ideas and all these things, intent and purpose pushed down to the teams, but the level of leadership not just in the team of teams, but also in this middle layer of management, have to keep their eyes open for opportunities to apply systems thinking. Double loop learning is the right um, word phrase to use to um, basically say challenging assumptions and say, why are we doing this the same way we've done it for 30 years? The world has changed. We shouldn't do it this way. It's cumbersome. And so somebody needs to take ownership about challenging those age old assumptions and have the right culture and freedom to do so. So um, if we do that and we trust the people who have the information, um, the people closer to the work, the day-to-day -day functioning of the company, they should be the ones helping to inspire what the future company looks like. So we have this idea, let's not have three layers of approval to buy a corporate cell phone anymore. Here's my proposal. Why don't we do this simpler? It's a lot easier. Okay, great. Somebody somewhere makes a decision and now the company all of a sudden does things in a simpler way. So I was just trying to give sort of quick hand waving over what those four principles for those four values out of the scaling manifesto mean to me and how you might think about them in the context of being agile on a team of teams in a company. Um, this is the rest of the scaling manifesto. I leave this to you to read on your own uh, in the same way that uh, the 12 principles that come with the original Agile Manifesto kind of get to a greater level of detail and explain some of the specifics of what the intentions are. Um, you'll find something similar here in the supporting principles that reflect a lot of um, what you might have heard me say throughout the talk tonight. Um, of course, the Scaling Manifesto is a framework, uh, kind of guidelines or philosophy, like I said. Um, I think it's the kind of thing you should use as inspiration to then build your own point of view about what the right actual implementation strategy are. And um, the companies that you see the best sort of success stories out there are ones that are perhaps using a mixture, kind of a hodgepodge of all of the variable, variable frameworks out there. Um, I know uh, JP Morgan Chase in my backyard here is doing a lot with less. Um, I know they're stealing bits and pieces of um, SAFE at M&T, but we're also doing a bunch of other things that are kind of homegrown. Um, I know uh, great companies are stealing pieces of the Flow framework, and uh, Julius on the phone here with me introduced me not that long ago to this Xscale framework, which is, again, something similar to the scaled uh, scaling manifesto that sort of um, sets the cultural tone and some of the inspirational things you might think about almost from more of an XP perspective, um, if I remember that right. Um, in any case, these are other things you should do to consider, um, but it's definitely uh, you know exercise left for the reader. How do you want to scale Agile? At least have a framework with which to think about it. And uh, I'd encourage you to keep revisiting that scaled Agile, uh, the scaling manifesto before you jump to conclusions that might be uh, part of a specific framework like Scaled Agile. Um, and so 
I would love to open up the floor for questions. We have plenty of time. We'll stick around tonight. Um, and we do have folks here who actually wrote the scaling manifesto. If you have questions for them, um, they were happy to join us. They were like, holy cow, there's people in Buffalo, New York that want to talk about the scaling manifesto. So I would encourage you to reach out and ask questions. I'm happy to answer anything I can as well. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, what what questions do people have? What what's what's going on? What are your responses? What are your your thoughts? I have a question for our authors that are here tonight. What were some of the driving uh, and or motivating factors behind coming together to, to write the uh, scaling manifesto? So I think um, all of us probably have some different thoughts. I know from a consulting perspective. I was, you know, personally a little frustrated with time after time clients are continually saying, right, we, haven't, we haven't done Agile, but we want you to come in and install X framework across X number of teams. Um, and from a personal perspective, I always, that that is anti-Agile in my opinion. Um, why don't we just start small and work in a small batch, work with one team, learn from that, and then expand from there. Um, and that would just be a better way of scaling in my opinion. Um, Dane, I'm not sure if you have some other thoughts to it. Yeah, I mean, I think a big part was noticing patterns, right? We we were trying to help various companies become more agile, and we saw these kind of same anti patterns repeated, and um, and just as we kind of have that touch point of the agile manifesto, that once you kind of understand it, buy into it, we can refer back to it. And be like, this is this is what we both agree on. We wanted something about scaling that we could refer to and say, this is our shared vision for how to approach scaling. Whether you know you're promoting safe or less or something else, um, right? Like there should be some things that we agree on that we're trying to get to, and we wanted something to also, or I at least wanted something that we could refer to as like this is our shared vision for how to approach this. And now that we've established that, let's get into the details of how we're going to do it. Kevin, I should jump in. I should have just asked the first question without uh, waiting for you because this is the first time I'm meeting Andrew and Dane like in real life as well. And I want to just ask you, did I butcher it? Did I get it? Does it like resonate with you or how did I do? We have we have notes that we'll send you. No. Okay, please. <laughs> no, it's good. it's good. You can embarrass me in front of all these people if you want. It's no big deal. No, I mean, I thought it was really good. Um, I think... Framing it from a, a startup perspective is super interesting because that's not a, an area I've worked in, but I think it's a good way to think about all the different responsibilities involved and how to scale from there. Um, and one side note, Nicole Spenskoon also just joined us. who's another co-author. So, yeah. Thank you, Nicole, for joining. Hi. Hello. I'm just juggling children, so but I'm listening. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Yeah. Um, just since you mentioned the startup thing, Andrew, I actually just joined a startup. Um, and your, uh, Brian, your set of like the C-suite actually lines up pretty closely to the C-suite that we have. Oh, cool. Um, and we just hit, what did we hit? Uh, like 15 engineers in the engineering organization. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm here to help them figure out yeah. how to scale, right? It's um, like, we're already too big for one team. Now, how much process and structure do we start throwing into place? Or can we still have that startup you yeah. know, mentality be adaptive and responsive to change? Dane, I miss that so much. Um, my uh, claim to fame was working at Dig, and we grew so fast that we went from three to nine to 25 developers over the course of like two years. And we had to evolve our process drastically in order to, for it to all make sense again, because it's just, it moves quickly. So uh, good luck. It's definitely an interesting ride. Your experience will be super helpful. Hoping. So I've got a question, Brian, uh, but you oh, know, boy. maybe, maybe Andrew and Dane would be willing to help you out with this. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, but one of the things as I, as I think about scaling is, is we focus so much on scaling. We focus so much on connections across teams and, and radiating information in the connection. And we seem to gloss over that maybe descaling is important. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can comment on that or if there's any sort of feedback or advice you can offer those of us on the call uh, as to 
how that might play into this. No, I, I'd love that. And, and hopefully it, it came through a little bit that, you know, if you don't need to scale, you shouldn't scale. But like you should find purpose and meaning in any kind of process change that you apply. And that's kind of what I was hinting at with Dane there is that if you have a team of just three people and they're just meddling around in production code, like that's bad. So fix that. But don't add extra process to help them communicate when there's just three people. But if you've got 50 people, all of a sudden you need just enough process to be able to communicate. And um, in large companies like the one that we're working with right now, um, I think there's an expectation that there's a pattern that has to be applied. And therefore, you just stamp that pattern one more time and fill the slots. And what I would love to see um, our contemporaries and other folks on the call think about is maybe it's okay to just have one team floating off by themselves while you have a bunch of other agile uh, release trains. Who cares if they don't need any other dependencies and they're fully independent and self-sufficient, then that's how they should be. So Brian, maybe I'll be a little bit more explicit with my question. Um, let's assume that I go into an organization because many of us do work in large enterprises, be that in Canada or the US, and we work in large enterprises where we already have dozens, if not hundreds of teams. We spend so much time talking about scaling and coordinating across those, and we spend almost zero time talking about how we can descale the organization as it exists today. Oh. Yeah. And that's, I think, the question that I'm trying to get to a little bit more. How do we do both? Yeah. How do you fix the politics and destroy the fiefdoms and undo the hierarchies and the years and years of organizational structure mentality, right? Um, we've all seen the big companies think about their teams of teams as a new hierarchy to build the company upon when they should be thinking about it as the leanest possible process to deliver that particular solution. And that org hierarchy is something different. And so I don't know if that's kind of what you're getting at. I don't know how to solve that problem, Jeff. I wonder if and anybody else here has dealt with this idea of, um, you hear companies call about flattening their hierarchy or descaling, right? Well, I've certainly gotten fired as a coach a few times for suggesting that. Um, right. Where I, I, that means you're and, doing and, it right. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I didn't feel bad about that. I felt like, you know, my job was to give my honest opinion and, you know, I, I'll use a, uh, anonymized example where, you know, I, I was at a, you know, a large company, um, everybody know their name. Um, and we were working on a six web page registration process, not rocket surgery, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And they had something like 40 people on the core team. And then dozens of dependencies to make this happen. Um, and so clearly there had been a loss of perspective for what engineering could build. And there was no understanding of the complexity of every time you add a dependency or a person with the communication and you know, challenges that come with that. And so sometimes I think the answer is just to give the, the hard truth. Uh, and maybe sometimes, and like I said, I got fired in this case. So, uh, you know, this I don't necessarily take this if you need to feed your family and this is an important client, but you know, I literally just built the whole thing myself with a pair. I grabbed one engineer on the team. I'm like, Hey, let's, let's just pair on this and see if we could do a prototype. And our prototype met every single requirement of the product. And we did it in two days. I love it. Cause you know, it was six pages. It wasn't like we were super engineers. We just threw away all the junk. And so sometimes I think just showing reality is a really valuable thing. Uh, you know, do it at your own risk, but uh, mm. yeah. One of, the, one of the things I did over the last year was uh, it's kind of exactly as you said, they built agile release trains basically around the organizational hierarchy that existed already. So it had nothing really to do with the teams needing to interact with each other. It was they all reported to the same technology director. Um, and a lot of what I did last year was kind of walking through these and saying, okay, do these two teams actually need to talk to each other? And a lot of them are like, yeah, of course, they're, they're, all, they're, all, they're all part of Barry's world. It's fine. Um, so what we wound up doing and kind of talking to Barry and some of the senior leaders was saying, hey, so let's actually see how often these dev leads and these teams are actually communicating with each other outside of the ceremonies that you're forcing them to have. And when those numbers came back, zero, not, they're not happening. They're not doing it at all. 
it became in the manager's mind, Hey, this is an actual waste of time. And I'm, and again, it's more about how you say it, at least from my perspective. So I didn't change anything. Barry came down and said, Hey, we're breaking up these agile release trains because this is my decision. And from my perspective, I don't care who drives the car, as long as the car goes the way we want it to go. Um, so for at least what I've seen is making, if that management structure is the problem, sometimes making them the hero, it almost get it, it, it got where we wanted it to go. Let's put it that way. I was nicely done. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Dean. Give me no, 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 no. I, I was going to respond actually earlier to this thing about adding complexity, right, as opposed to the desire to descale. And I was desperately trying to find an article um, that about human psychology that in almost any problem, humans prefer to add as a way of solving something, mm -hmm. right? And they even gave this basic, like you have this Lego structure, flat uh, piece supported by a single brick, and you're supposed to make it stable so it doesn't wobble. Right. You can actually remove the single brick, put it directly on the base below it. You'll have right. the most stable thing. But instead, awesome. people add these bricks in as the solution. Mm -hmm. And so just I think it's something to be aware of that our, our human nature pulls us towards adding rather than subtracting. It's the same up. reason people don't refactor their code or delete old lines of code that are causing more bugs and challenges. It's the same thing. Um, especially in big legacy organizations, they are more attracted towards safe uh, because of the fact that they also talk about uh, these values and principles in a scaled manner. And they also provide the context within which they could execute those things. Like, you know, for example, PI planning that's connected with the values and principles that safe is talking about. So this question is for uh, Andrew and Dane that, do you plan to expand on this scaling manifesto and come up with the context within which, you know, organizations and teams and executives can operate um, and still, you know, be uh, lean away from safe and still scale uh, agile um, to an enterprise level? You want to jump in first, Dane, or me? <laughs> I was waiting for you because I'm not. <laughs> well, well, so I, I think one thing about expanding it is that, um, I mean, we've open sourced this and we want feedback to see how it can grow. But I think specifically right now, it, it is really limited to just scaling and not necessarily like expanding it out towards leadership. And when the reason is we start, when we first started thinking about this, we started writing about leadership principles and that created a whole snowball effect of like almost a, a leadership manifesto in itself. Um, so, I, but all this stuff is interrelated. So, I, I think the idea is to answer your question: Are we going to expand it? I think we want it to be living and get feedback on it and see how we can improve it. Um, but right now, it is pretty limited, to just like principles for scaling, and not necessarily beyond that for all the various you know broader systemic things that go into scaling, um, which are you know get into leadership and all these other things. And just to add to the leadership, right? Um, Brian, you had that slide early on showing the single team with that C-suite and the VC and so forth. And leadership matters a lot, even at that point. You haven't scaled, but it actually really matters whether you have good leadership there. And there's a whole set of principles and there's a whole literature out there around that. Mm -hmm. And we weren't looking to cover that. We could also get into customer experience and under, like customer centricity. There's just so many things you could get into that all really matter. And we were trying to keep our scope focused on scaling. Yeah, um, and then also one thing related to to safe specifically is we're we're not uh, in competition with safe, right? We we're looking to have values and principles here that apply whether you're trying to use safe or you're using less or um, any of the other different scaling frameworks. Uh, we're not trying to be we're not trying to be a framework. So it, it's Deb, I have a question. Uh, being at a larger organization and we have many agile release trains with common stakeholders and common leadership across many of the trains. What are your thoughts about using some type of similar framework across all those arts so that there can be consistency more across the organization and some common practices as opposed to just running and figuring stuff out on your own. Well, so I, I think if we look at the um, the leftover right mantra of 
uh, shared vision over aligned processes. Like aligned processes are, are still important. Um, we're not saying that we shouldn't have, you know, some sort of baseline necessarily, if it makes sense. Um, but the shared vision is going to get you further. But as far as, you know, aligned processes go, I think it's important um, to, to real, in my perspective, to be really more principle driven as, a, as opposed to practice and framework driven of making sure that, you know, teams are, you know, aligned around the common uh, practices that, that make sense. Um, they're, they're, meet, they're meeting, you know, the common goals, but they don't have to do everything the same way to make that happen. Now, now in a really big organization, obviously there's, you know, the, there's complexities with onboarding. Every team has a different onboarding process. Maybe that gets hard, but maybe that's just a sign that, you know, every team needs to have, you know, the, the it moves from st not standardized processes, but let's have like, you know, each team is responsible for how they do onboarding or something like that to make sure that people are up to speed. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting dichotomy for sure. Any other thoughts from anyone on that? Thanks for the reply. I'm wondering if there's something specific you've seen or encountered um, that you're reacting to. Oh, just my own organized chaos of trying to get things moving. <laughs> yeah. I found in my experience that when people try to align all of their processes just to have consistency, then uh, we start playing the game of... Uh, you know, everybody's trying to play to the, the process rather than focus on satisfying our customers and focusing on those principles. Keith, I'll, I'll piggyback on that and say that my, my observation recently is when the more you give a team to follow, the less they'll think for themselves on how to experiment and adapt and overcome their own challenges. That's, I think that's the real danger in predefined process. Yeah, and I, I think that good practices will spread organically, right? If, if we're letting people talk and letting people think for themselves, good processes are going to win out over bad processes. They're, they're, they're better, right? They create better outcomes. People incent them better. Um, they're going to win out. So I, I don't think that it needs to be something that's done intentionally. Um, I think where processes align organically, they probably Alexa. should. And where they don't, maybe Turn they should. Turn things like to 100%. Yep. Great. Thanks, guys. It's tempting to want to standardize things. <laughs> and I think we're butting up against, uh, I'm a big fan of the Dreyfus learning model. I don't know how many people are familiar with it here, but one of the things that it does pretty well is, I'm not going to get into detail, is it talks about how in the beginning, we need context-free rules. Just do this, right? Here's a recipe for making a cake. You use two eggs, you use a cup and a half of flour, you mix them this way, you use your oven this to temperature. Uh, don't make a cake with that recipe. I don't bake a cake, so I don't have any idea if that's actually accurate. Um, but you want a context-free recipe. Just do it this way and you'll get something that's kind of like a cake. And that's great for beginners. Um, and beginners need that according to the Dreyfus model of learning. Whereas uh, as you crawl up the, the pyramid of the Dreyfus model and you, be, you approach mastery, whatever level you happen to be at, those same rules are what holds you back. And so that's interesting in the context of scaling because we essentially have a lot more people that are beginners and need simple rules that they can apply that will almost always get them a good result. Whereas those same rules will hamstring your best people and your best teams and hold you back from true excellence. That's, you know, when they get to that point. So I think understanding that, I hate to use the word maturity, mm -hmm. um, you know, and knowing when to apply the rules and when not to is yeah. another big piece of how we can simplify this scaling. And, and not, you know, like a lot of us on this, this call, you know, I, I know several of the people here are, you know, 10, 20 years into this agile thing, right? Where we've been there and done that a bunch of times. And so we find those rules uh, often abhorrent. But yeah. that new person that's just like, I just joined my first Agile team as a product owner, scrum master, developer, QA, whatever, they, they just kind of want to know, like, how do I do something and don't screw this all up? Just tell me what to do a little bit. Yeah. And I'll get to the point where I can be self-actualized about this, but not today. Just tell me how to do my job today. You know, Julius, that, um, that comment is really good. And I think it resonated with Karina uh, Silverduke, a uh, previous colleague of mine, said, put minimal guardrails in place. She reminds me of a story that she and I, she taught me, I think, from uh, CIS here in Columbus that uh, Google actually kind of uses this river analogy 
to say that, you know, the water is deepest in the center where we have experience and practices and we've made mistakes and we've used these tools and these processes before, but the river is wider. And so you can go swim off to the side and experiment with other things because that's where some of the innovation happens. But if you're brand new and you don't know what the heck you're doing, stick to the center of the river. Use the stuff that we know has worked and we have patterns and people and communities you can rely upon. But the right company has balance there and says, let's not say thou shalt must be scrum and nothing else because that just stifles innovation. Let's create some level of openness so that people are encouraged to kind of experiment a little bit because they might stumble upon the thing that all of a sudden is better than anything else they're doing, right? Yeah, so Brian, to that, so Brian, to that point, you said, you know, um, you know, doing Scrum and, and everybody does that. Um, you know, I, you know, being with the organization, we are in a large organization and we've got some maturity. We have some newer teams, but we have varying degrees of maturity. And then you've got varying degrees of management, management styles, et cetera. Um, and what I'm finding is that as we're maturing, more teams are onboarded and the, the department or the, or the organization continues to grow, more guard rails in some cases are being put up. So how do you manage that? Or you know, you're going down one path and I would think more guard rails would have been up at the beginning. And what I'm finding in some cases is more guard rails are being put up now. Yeah. Um, large organizations are complex, right? We have people that haven't quite adopted the right mindset, whether it's a leadership mindset or an agile mindset, and they need both ultimately to be able to guide the organization down the right path. I think there's still some leaders out there that are fearful of what this agile stuff is doing to their job, to the hierarchy of the company, to their ability to control their own destiny. And um, it's hard to take your hands off the steering wheel, I think, when you're a middle manager, senior middle manager in this world of big companies trying to turn agile. And um, these things take a long time to shake themselves out. Um, you know, your company is in the middle of a very you know, early stage of the transformation. There's five or 10 years in front of us to, to really see some of that maturity help smooth out some of those difficulties. Um, so I think we're experimenting we, with some things that are bound to fail. Yeah. And how do we help with that? You know, I, I look at, cause we've got some great mature yeah. um, scrum masters and POs and things like that. And then how do we help those that aren't there yet at the various levels to say, Hey, you know, here's some writing on the wall that maybe doesn't make sense. And here's why. I, I have one quick idea that I'd love to hear other people chime in on that. I, I think celebrating success stories is the best thing we can do because if somebody's doing it really well and they're having tremendous results and happy customers and profitable, blah, 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 then that's great. That story travels far. And then the other stuff fizzles out eventually. What else has people seen though, that how do you help a big company navigate their way through some of these complexities? Um, I, I, I think um, definitely along the lines of what you were saying, Brian, is, you know, really, really investing in your community of practice, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the people who have been around, who have the experience, who know the pitfalls, and they can definitely share with the, the newer teams who are coming on. And I think that way of learning and sharing those success stories um, would really help is really investing in your community of practice. Yep. And Amy, what you don't have in the community right now is a broader exposure to the junior people. We have a lot of the same voices that show up to the communities today. And as, a, as you build a central community, the agile community of practice, where hundreds of people show up, then you have people across organizational boundaries, across roles, across levels of experience, learning from each other. All of a sudden, those things travel a little further. Right now, we have microcosms that we're speaking to ourselves, which is great because we're still learning, but <laughs> yep. we need to broaden and invite more and more new people in. Brian, one of the things that I think you mentioned earlier that kind of jumps out of my mind here too, is the idea of, of get, getting it right or starting with one or two teams yep. and then letting those one or two become 
three or four and letting them those become six or eight, as opposed to trying to do 200 teams all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And to Amy, to your point is that um, maybe there's there's a, a challenge with trying to, um, yeah, you know, I don't want to say the blind leading the blind, but but you know, we we heard Dane, we heard Andrew, we heard Brian talk about let's get one or two and then be able to share a story because those great ideas that Kevin mentioned will propagate as great things emerge, great patterns emerge from mm -hmm. one area. It can inform what others are doing as others start and go on that journey along with them. Mm -hmm. Hey, Amy, you, yeah. you know, one of the things that I saw and we started in two when I moved over to the business was we do a great job educating and bringing up our technology folks. And they're still new to this for the most part, but our business also, they need to understand how it's going to work. We have going from a real uh, delivery driven culture to this more idea, ideation type culture. And I think that's hard for some of the business. So education with them has seemed to help. And I think some of the things like, um, uh, I don't know if it was you, Jeff, that, that mentioned them, um, or, or Brian, the success stories, uh, you know, show and tells and bringing business in to see things that happen quicker. Um, it just builds that confidence and trust. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Steve. And, I, and I'm lucky because our business partners and POs are awesome. They really are, and they embrace it. And I know there's other teams that are very challenged. Um, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we, you know, and and it is, it, no matter where you are, it's hard to break that. I'm lucky with my team. I have good POs. One of the other things I've seen, um, at least uh, at Bank of America, was those show and tells. Sometimes it matters who's telling the story. Um, so what if myself as a vice president and agile coach, a senior vice president isn't going to care that much what I think. And they're not going to, they're not going to love my story as much as if their peer, someone they're competing for that promotion with someone that they have that peer to peer relationship with it, their team and their organization is moving forward. They're driving. That's what they're going to take notice. And at least that's what I've seen. So mm -hmm. if there's any of the um, strong allies in the senior leadership that can tell those stories, I think that they, it, it preaches louder to the organization. At least that's what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Certainly reinforcement from the top can only help mm -hmm. whether it's in the form of a, you know, sprint demo or just the occasional <laughs> stopping by and reinforcing things, repeating the same things. I'm actually going to post a link in the, in the chat here. This is, this is maybe a controversial take to take, uh, sort of thing to post. Um, but uh, we're talking about changing the, the attitudes and behaviors of people. Uh, the UK released a paper called Mindspace. Uh, I don't remember when it was. It was a while back that I first read it. Um, but it talks about some of the things that people were just touching on. So where is the message coming from? And, and this, is, this is, you know, it, it's all about how do you control the behavior of entire populations? You, know, you can look at it as for good, how do you get more people to vote? Or you can misuse these. These are tools. They're, they're, they're values-free. Um, but it's actually a pretty interesting look at what are the things you think about. So they, MindSpace is an acronym that stands for uh, Messenger, Incentives, Norms, Default, Salience, Priming, Affect, uh, Commitments, and Ego, right? And those are the things that they think about when they're forming a message that has to influence an entire population. And when you're in a big enough company, you're basically facing the same problem. Uh, and so we can learn a lot from uh, propaganda and how the pros do this. I'm a big fan of finding the best people in the world at something and uh, shamelessly stealing their work and using it for my own success. Uh, you know, the UK government has a lot more money to put into figuring out how to get people to do things in mass than I do. Uh, so it's, it's not a bad place to start if you wanna look at these things like who is your messenger, right? So to, to your point, I don't remember who said it, but we are heavily influenced by who communicates the information. That's, that's the very first letter of the Mindspace acronym. And I'll try to keep that my only evil hypnosis brainwashing tip of the day. <laughs> well, this is great. I love all the dialogue and it, it's kind of got me thinking because I'm, you know, part of a large organization working on scaling agile that what I'm finding is that the actual teams are doing a great job with everything and the arts are doing a great job, but the stakeholders are really struggling right now as far as 
trying to understand how to get rid of the safety nets that they've built over time of, um, you know, the predictability of how things flow and how we think of and be able to articulate, although all these different teams are doing it all these different ways, we can trust communication will eventually reach the right person or that um, folks are thinking about all of the right things and be able to articulate that to examiners and stuff. I'm just wondering if if anyone who's scaled Agile has seen that bureaucracy peel back and is there a way to accelerate that? Yeah, I, I think part of that comes with, um, you know, showing some data that, that, that really indicates that, you know, all that predictability and everything else was uh, just kind of artificial and that people were playing games with the tools to make it look like it was predictable. But um, really, and, and, you know, that predictability is, it, it, you know, and, and, and all that stuff comes with uh, the understanding that they're looking at output um, and, and not as much at outcomes. And, um, you know, so let's, let's take a look at our, our customer satisfaction. Let's take a look at, um, you know, some, some metrics that really matter to our business and, uh, and, and see how we're impacting those. Because that's what we're really trying to do, not like, you know, get more stories done or points, whatever those are. Yeah, for the good of the organization. Do the, make the right choices for the company, not just to have a better process or whatever. And data can ser serve that purpose. Brian, I, I, I have kind of two questions, um, if, if I may. Um, that, that was actually really cool. I'm, I'm curious, though, because a lot of the pre-existing condition for what we're talking about is something you said is, is creating that alignment um, and and creating that shared vision so that teams can make the right decision. Um, I, I know there was a little bit of hand waving going on there, but how do you do that in a large organization? How does a vision actually inspire the teams to do the right work? Let's be let let's be really tact, tact, uh, tactical here if, if if we can. Yeah. What would you do in a large organization to create the alignment? from the vision that your senior leaders have for the, for their organization through the middle senior frontline managers so that the teams are getting that that clear articulation of of which direction yeah. they're going well and there's something really important about the way you're asking the question and what I think you're implying because no one's expecting to be told what to do if we're doing agile right but we're being told what to accomplish, right? And so the goal statements or the vision statements of a company should be formed in that context to say in this quarter, we would like to expand into customer segment X and increase volume of sales by Y. And that's like a lovely high level goal that some executive somewhere can say, this is where we should be going. We should be selling more into commercial than consumer or whatever that big fluffy metric is. And then the difficult job is for the people at a layer down to then translate that to say, in my segment, in my team of teams, what that means to us, the lens through which that product owner on that team of teams has to then apply that to say, okay, we have an objective, we have a key result. I got this big list of stuff I could do. Which things on this list actually align with that particular goal that my executive said was important. And they have to make those hard choices about what to do and what not to do. I think there's a step though that people skip and it's about translating that high level vision, hopefully well phrased with sort of objectives, uh, outcome, desired outcomes um, and customer context and translating it into that sort of meaningful product roadmap. And I use that word generically. It can be you know, implemented in any number of ways that says uh, a senior product owner, for example, on a team of teams might have to think long and hard about what stuff they're doing or could be doing aligns properly. And then they have to prioritize it and they have to sequence it and they have to make sure it makes sense and that they can actually accomplish it. 
And so there's a lot of complexity there, as you know, about trying to do that well. But um, I think it comes into that filter of what to say no to and to be really critical of looking at the backlog items. And, you know, you could build a spreadsheet about how well it scores or something ridiculous about how it aligns, but somehow data-driven, uh, hopefully you can then say, if I accomplish this epic in the next three months, we will have helped to achieve that sales objective against that customer segment. I think one of, the, one of the really key things in, in what you were just talking through, Brian, was transparency. Um, all too often we have layers of management or layers of leadership that say, um, well, yeah, my boss asked me to do this thing. So I'm going to translate that, but I'm not going to tell you what my boss asked me to do. I'm going to tell you what I want you to do in order to accomplish that. And they think that that's, that's secret to them. That's their special sauce is that they know what the organization really wants. Um, and, and what they should be doing, what I, what, what would be more effective is if they were transparent about that, they, they had a conversation with their team and said, you know, my boss asked me to do this thing. How can we accomplish that? These are my ideas. Do you have any ideas? What, what do you want to do? Right. And, and we build that transparency all the way down the chain. And if we have that transparency, that's where vision comes from, where a clear vision comes from. Well, and Kevin and Jeff, if we're honest, most companies are not creating beautifully articulated vision statements that are getting ignored. Right. They're fumbling on that big picture stuff also by not setting the right level of purpose and intent for companies. And therefore, some companies are just off scrambling, building whatever the heck they think makes sense based off of something they heard somebody in a hallway say. Maximize and so part of it is really inspiring leadership to do it the right way. Well, and there's, I think, part of the magic, right? You said the word uh, part of it is inspiring leadership. I think part of the challenge is also is inspiring leadership, leaders that actually inspire, that have more than let's increase some you know vague business metric in whatever industry you're in by 7.5%. Right, next right. quarter. Ten percent more than people. last quarter, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That doesn't get people <laughs> excited. That doesn't change the world, right? This is why, you know, you know, some companies consistently make great products is they actually inspire their people to to do something that's great that will have a difference that they can tell their, you know, mom that doesn't know anything about their industry about, and they're like, oh, my kid did that. Yeah, my kid's awesome, and, right? And you know what that, July? You know what that means to me? It's like passion, right? Yeah. So, like, if you don't have, if you don't know who you are. If you don't know why you exist, then you can't accomplish anything, right? Exactly. Like, how do you actually create the right inspiration if you don't know what your company is there for? So you have to have a great purpose statement. You have to be purpose-driven. You have to understand your customers' passions and what services you can provide to solve those things. And awesome. also what that means is saying no to a bunch of crap you've probably done for 50 years and focus on the things that actually matter. So you got to actually talk to customers. You got to actually figure out what problems are worth solving. And then you have to write your vision statements that inspire people to build the right things. You can't just say, let's try and do 147 things again this quarter, folks, because no one's going to deliver anything of value. But if you said there's seven things that will make us an industry leader, and if we can move the nugget on item one and two, then people can get behind that. Absolutely. And I'll take that just, a, just one step further. You, you said, you know, ask your customers what they, what they want. I, I'd say, you know, it, it's great if you can give your customers what they're asking for, but if you can find the pain that your customer has given up, given up on ever fixing and solve that, that's magic for a company, right? You know, that thing that they're like, you know, this is just why my life sucks. Um, you know, if you can take it that far, that's what gets people really excited because your, your competitors can listen to what they say too, right? You know, your whole industry is probably somehow trying to listen to the words they're saying. And if yeah. you're not getting beyond the words and you're seeing the pain and what's behind the pain and figuring out how to leverage process or technology or, ah. or corporate assets to solve something nobody else knew how to solve, then yeah. you'll do something amazing, right? Like, you know, the iPhone came about because somebody said, what do I do with this weird display I can control with 10 fingers at once, Yeah. right? you know, and it changed an industry, right? I missed a great opportunity to draw a parallel to startups there, right? Competitive yeah. advantage, product market fit, do something that's Absolutely. unique and different, right? Yep. That's what all the startups are struggling out there to do, to carve some new niche that matters to somebody that solves a, an itch they didn't know they had or, or <laughs> something that's a, a, a pain point of a customer's experience, whether it's your core value proposition from five years ago or not. 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's not surprising we're on the same direction there since I, you know, we share a lot. Well, of and that's, before. that's really the innovation loop that I think a lot of companies miss, right? They build an innovation think tank on the side. They don't bake it into the teams. They don't make it part of the process. Um, if you apply design thinking right. principles, if you actually create this high level value statement, of your company, you can create innovation everywhere at the same time. Yeah. And so that getting that passion, that, that innovative passion flowing through your organization, that's how you get people inspired to do great things. Yeah. Um, you know, we, um, when we teach the agile stuff to individual teams, um, the mindset and things, it's like, there's a, I wish I re can remember the statistics, but if you pe teach people on teams why they exist and what their purpose is, all of a sudden they actually care about what mm -hmm. they're doing and they don't view their jobs as a cog in the machine, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they can understand that if I build this one stupid little thing, COBOL or whatever the heck it might be, Julius, and it delivers value to my customers and you know that customer's name because you've got your personas written on the wall, right? I made Sally happy because I showed up to work today, all of a mm -hmm. sudden the people are probably more loyal. They're more excited about their job. They care more about their teammates and it's part of a, a, the working system that connects them to the big picture. But you have to start with why you have to tell them why it matters. And that has to be top down driven. Otherwise you miss it. Well, and, and that touches on another thing that I think is one of the hardest things to scale, which is that customer empathy, customer insight, customer connection, right? When you're a startup, everybody in the startup can go actually like do the job of whatever they're trying to solve, right? You know, I, I was at a startup a number of years ago that was in the hotel industry. I knew nothing about the hotel industry. Before I took the job, I required them to put me on the job in a hotel doing what yeah. I was going to be building software for. And so I met those people. I knew what their life was like. That's pretty hard if you're, you know, a 50,000 person organization. Yeah. So how you scale that is probably... I would say a lot harder than how do you scale technology stuff. Andrew, I, I love your comment there. It's hard to be simple, basically, right? I mean, like I would have written a shorter speech, but I didn't have time, right? It's like. <laughs> but yeah, it's true. I mean, when you see objectives that just wind on and on, um, it's good. It's It gets back to that guardrails conversation. It's good to have some sort of constraint in place to focus the team. It's, it's not about limiting them, but it's about focusing, you know, yeah, what, yeah. The, what their objective is and, and the creative solutions they can employ within that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, if I bring that all the way back to a startup analogy, um, pivoting is commonplace in the startup world, right? We experimented 10 times. They all failed. The product sucked. Let's do this other thing because we're smart enough and it's on, you know, uses the same technology. And then instead of building, you know, taxi cab messengers, you're building Twitter. <laughs> Brian, can I ask you another question? Um, yeah. You and, 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 and Andrew there and, and July just sort of touched on something that I'm interested about. Um, out of that startup world, you talked really about being very close to the customer and being able to get that feedback. In many large organizations, not only are people far from the customer, um, and don't often, Julius, get the opportunity to go and do the job of the person. But there are these product teams that are put in place to create this additional layer of telephone between, um, you, you know, the, the, the thinkers, the smart people talking to the customers, and then the people just go and build the thing that we told you to build. How does that work? Or how do you reconcile that in the context of something like the scaling manifesto? And Jeff, because we tell people you should talk to customers, right? But you're saying most people don't. Yeah. And they don't have the opportunity to because of the organizational structure yeah. in, in yeah. many places. Um, you know, in, in the agile workshops that we've been teaching and our client, we say that all the time. Like, yes, actually talk to your customers because there's usually like people feel like there's an invisible barrier that they're not allowed to. And, you know, maybe that's a sales channel guy is the only one that's allowed to actually talk to the customer. Um, I, often though, there isn't that rule. It's just assumed. Um, the last place that I worked, we created something like I, I made it a big hairy deal and said, we're going to build a customer development program. And I outlined it in PowerPoint and pre presented to executives and said, we're going to talk to customers and we're going to build a beta product development cycle. And it was inspired by a lot of the work I did at Chef, where we just talked to customers like every day, never built anything unless there was a, a customer willing to buy it. 
And so we, we launched this thing. It was really nothing more elaborate than find somebody willing to see the product before it's finished and give you feedback. It was that simple. And we literally got on video calls with people in France and was showing them a product that before it was done and saying, could you imagine yourself using this? What would you do? And asked like basic user experience questions. And the feedback we got was unbelievable. And it saved us millions of dollars of not building the wrong thing. And so like, I don't know how you do that in an organization to just say, go freaking talk to customers. But like, that's the answer. Well, I think yeah, I, yeah I think, and it's funny because, you know, in, in less with the one product owner model, um, which they advocate for, the product owner is going to be so busy in a scale environment that they can't actually talk to the customers. So they advocate, talk, have the team talk to the customers, customers directly. Um, so a project we worked on where, I mean, the, the, the product owner is really focused on sort of the big picture level of what we need to do. And the teams had to, as a result, you know, get feedback from a beta environment with end users on a regular recurring basis. And, you know, I mean, that that's the answer, but it's it's not necessarily an easy answer to say, like, well, the team needs to talk to the customer, but that is that is what you need to find a way to do. Yeah, uh, same uh, same setting as what Andrew's talking about, but it's at a large government organization with a huge number of software development teams. Right. They could definitely have gone down the path of, oh, you have to go through the one specialized group who's allowed to talk to people. Right. Mm -hmm. But instead, all of the development teams were expected to engage in user research and uh, design and um, and do these things. And so we would have, you know, someone who had some of the skills for interviewing a user, you know, paired with the developer and they're both meeting with the users and taking notes and so forth. Like it was it was direct contact between mm -hmm. the teams and the and the customers. And users. It doesn't have to be hard. And, you know, again, when I was at a startup here in Columbus, Ohio, um, I just emailed a hundred customers. And the first dozen that emailed me back that were in town, I offered to buy burritos to come in and like see a demo and give us feedback. I mean, it was like that simple, like, come on in, we'll eat some burritos together. And then all of a sudden we get into this two hour long discussion about their business model and what made sense to them. And what they would use and what they hated. And it was like, just creating the space for that conversation mm -hmm. allows some of that customer magic feedback stuff to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that goes even, you know, who's your customer? I look at our scrum community and we, we meet twice a week and chat, what's going on? What have you learned? What, what are your challenges? And just even by talking to our peers, we learn so much more, right? And it's talking to what's going on and what are your challenges? Mm -hmm. And I know I've changed the way I do things or the way I address things just by those conversations. Yeah. If people I think forget that they can go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I think one of the, one of the critical things in Jeff's question was that, um, you know, we, we're all saying, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be hard, right? Just go talk to them, just go do it. Um, and that that's true, but they don't know that they can, right. They think that that's not allowed. They think they're going to get in trouble for that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, th I think what, what I might try doing in that situation is try to show data about when we're delivering the wrong thing, right? What are the usage patterns of our stuff and when is it that we're delivering the wrong stuff and then start proposing some solutions to say, Hey, maybe, maybe more of us should talk to people, right? Maybe more of us should, uh, should get some of that feedback, um, to try and avoid delivering the wrong thing, right? De delivering something that isn't being used by our customers or that isn't solving our customers' problems. But I, th I think it's there, there's something deeper in that question. I don't know the answer to it necessarily, but it's it's more than just tell them to just do it because, well, sure, yeah. just Someone has to make it, it okay, just, right? Yeah, Somebody exactly. in authority has to make it okay. Right. Well, it's, it's, you know, I think you need to train them if you're really serious about this, right? So you need to train people in uh, observation, right? How do you know when you've hit on a hot button that you should go deeper on. Uh, how do you, you know, ask open-ended questions, right? That's the sort of the most basic level of training here when you're doing customer research. Um, how, how do you do uh, elicitation? Uh, that's the fancy word that spies you to get people to betray secrets that they shouldn't give. Um, you know, you can use it for goodness as well. Um, but, but I think, you know, the, the one question that sort of started with that's relevant to this discussion that we haven't touched on, and this actually has a simple answer. A lot of these answers aren't so simple, is uh, how do you scale that? Well, well, you partially scale it by just, recording it. Record the customer interaction, right? Record the customer observation. Obviously get permission. I'm not saying spy on people, um, you know, but record it and have the experts 
include their notes with that recording. So they say, oh, at 12 minutes and 47 seconds, they talked about this. And this gives me an idea for that. And other people- and now you hear it firsthand. It. Yeah, and get mm -hmm. their own firsthand. Once again, get away from this game of telephone. Video is cheap now, right? You know, we're, we're no longer in the world where capturing a video is a hard thing. Um, you know, you have to be careful with privacy and stuff like that. But scale with video and audio recordings and keep those as assets that anybody who has an interest can then, you know, retrieve on a pull basis will go a long ways towards at least the people that have a desire to know how to help the customer better or to know how their feature is going to be used or what's really going on can, can then get it, get it, right? Because the reality is if you're in a 10,000 person organization serving largely the same type of customer, you probably can't all go have an interview with one yeah. of your customers, right? Yeah. It's just no, that's, not physical. That's good. Um, James, you said you have a question about org structure. Yeah. So one of the things that has been really challenging for us is changes to org structure that is going to affect um, senior leadership and specifically kind of how promotions occur in a large organization. It's almost like collecting people. If you get 50 people, you are now a senior vice president. If you have a thousand people report to you, you're now a grand master director, vice president. I don't know. Got to build the pyramid. Uh, exactly. So how, how have I'm looking any advice on anyone who's fought the pyramid before and yeah. maybe won. I don't know. <laughs> I don't have any magic for that. <laughs> okay. How do you change? I, I, um, I blogged about it. I think there's a <laughs> toxic culture of middle management that needs to do a lot of relearning and a lot of starting with some unlearning. But um, that's the kind of thing that gets you close to getting fired as an agile coach. You ask too many questions of those people. Our um, our enterprise coaching team got got let go for that. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I'll recommend a book that I hate. Um, it's just the essence of everything that is wrong in the world in large corporations for me. Uh, Robert Greene's Forty Eight Laws of Power. Right. Um, I think there's a lot of advice where if you have to take it, you might want to consider changing your company instead of just changing the company. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all about navigating those highly political organization, organizations and how do you do that, you know, not so naively. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, we can hope that you're in an organization where people are actually aligned with real customer value and delivering on the company's vision. And then you can sort of find a way to connect them to that. And that's where I would use tools like, you know, there won't be time to go into this, but you know, Mike's probably familiar with some of these like sleight of mouth patterns to sort of reframe the way they're thinking about things to get their minds to open up a little bit. This is where uh, a little bit of sort of conversational psychographics so you can understand what a specific person you're trying to influence is motivated by because not everybody's motivated by the same things um, and sort of put things in that sort of context, you know, that they'll understand and connect with. But, um, you know, it's, it's dicey stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've been successful on the one-on-one -on -one level, try, just again, just trying to understand the individuals, but just looking at the organization as a whole and just the changes that would need to occur. And I think it's, like you said, it's that senior middle top management kind of protecting their own from change or from the change that they feel is going to negatively impact them. I, I, I don't, I, I'm just looking for some advice. I have no idea. So <laughs> So for an antidote to the person who got fired for suggesting a flatter organization, I was hired to have a flatter organization. Oh, nice. They formed a tiger team and then needed help with the supervision. So they hired me into to agile coach and have 28 people. So oh, wow. flatter. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's a fun job. Maybe not a fun job, but an impactful <laughs> job. It's a job. It probably involves letting some people go or repositioning people or uncomfortable things like that. Yeah. When I was at Dell Software, I think I had nine people between me and Michael Dell. That's a lot of hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they got 100,000 plus employees or something, but still. Lean supply chain, not lean bureaucracy. Yeah. You know, I, I think um, I, it just reminds me that there's so many complexities. The greater the uh, depth of hierarchical org charts you have, um, it means you have to work even harder at those sort of lean change management functions to roll out and implement any kind of change in an organization. Um, 
I don't know, uh, Jeff, you, I think you're friends with the author. Is there anything that this conversation reminds you about lean change management stuff that you could contribute? There's so many things. I'm um, worried about opening my mouth because Kevin's going to probably um, conscript. You should do a talk on that. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, Jason Little and lean change management is a fantastic topic. Um, it also reminds me of uh, Niles Flagling and organizing for complexity. Sounds like two fantastic resources. If, if in addition to like the, the resources that have been called out in the chat window here and that folks have mentioned are amazing. But those two uh, really come to mind as well. Niles Flagling, Organizing for Complexity, Jason Little, Lean Change Management. So Jeff, I think I heard you offer to get Jason to come talk, right? Yep, no problem. I will get Jason. <laughs> and if you're interested in paying hundreds of dollars for Jason's book, he has a ICP cat course that is geared towards the contents of his book. I went through it. It was pretty good. Cool. John, did you put your hand up there? It looks like you have a question. I do have a question. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, so Brian, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, getting teams to interact with customers. And, you know, I had worked at a, st a startup before and it was encouraged to like, I don't know, one day a week, just work on something cool, maybe form another startup. And I was at another company, larger organization, and I was sitting in a meeting and <clears throat> we were talking about ATMs and they're like, yeah, yeah, there's these ATMs in Europe that you can dump change into and it'll count your change and stuff. And I'm like, ATMs can do that. I'm like, that's pretty cool. And there's like ATMs that can hand out like gift cards and stuff like that. And I had no idea that ATM machines could do that. So I was thinking, and I, I talked to um, a couple of people on the team. I said, well, it'd be pretty cool if, you know, we're a bank, you know, maybe we can just get a, an ATM machine in the lobby that the team here can just experiment with stuff. Yeah. And, and add, like introduce that functionality. Crazy it's, cool features. Yeah. Cause we're all, all the, all the people at the bank are really customers of the machine where we, we are kind of the customers of what we're building. We are the customer. So um, I thought that would be interesting if, if, if you're in an organization and there, there's something that we're building, but allow the team to um, kind of experiment and try different things with the product. You know, and consider your own employees as potential customers in some cases. Yeah. Well, in some cases they are, you know, potential customers. So, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. You know, cause there was a concern about, um, you know, just, you know, talking to somebody that's using the ATM machine. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I, I tell people some of my stories at Dig where, you know, people talk about building minimal viable products. I'd be like, we'd scribble with crayon on a piece of paper and walk down the sidewalk and look for somebody that had heard about dig.com. If I drew, if I built this tomorrow, would you use it? So like the minimal amount of effort you can do to learn something is powerful. And so that's where some of the innovation happens and getting out there and talking to customers always generates some sort of learning. And so I don't know, I mean, and you know, Kevin, you, you nailed it before the company has to make that. Okay. It has to be part of the culture. You know, we talk about building a, 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 a you know, a culture of learning, a culture of uh, experimentation, but you also have to have some sort of, you know, embracing of your customers and the larger you are, uh, it seems like the further people get away from it. And if, if I think if you can't or disallowed explicitly, especially explicitly from engaging the customer, if you have the type of customer that you can simply observe that that's better than zero engagement whatsoever. Yeah. Right. I'd argue that trained observation is probably better than most interactions that you would have with the customer. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It throws people off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, right now I'm working for a, a grocery store, right? And uh, I can actually go into any of these stores and I can actually watch the customers do their thing. That's a lot right? of data you can collect quickly too. I oh, bet yeah. too, right? What'd they buy? What'd they do? Where'd they come from? Yeah. Right. And they have mm -hmm. that marketing cards. So they know everything I buy and what kinds of beer <laughs> I like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why don't they get better coupons though? Come on. 
I just want the Wegman shopping app to link with their scan app. So I have two different apps up at the same time and they're not linked. And I'm like, I want to be able to check it off, scan it and leave. So that may or may not be coming soon. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I love the, I love the two to, you know, but it'd be great if it could be together. Yep. Yeah, um, Dean, I love your comment about giving people opportunities. We say the same thing about sprint demos. It doesn't have to be the product owner that, that actually demonstrates the work. In the same way, it doesn't have to be the same person who talks to the customer. Um, I think that practicing empathy, giving people those opportunities, exposing more people to the actual agile process um, through learning, through doing is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it's getting close to eight o'clock. I really appreciate everyone um, hanging out and talking with us today. Um, I don't really have to be anywhere for a little while. If anyone wants to keep on hanging out and talking, um, there's no commute anymore. I'm just sitting here in my <laughs> office. So it's all good. Yeah, thank, thanks, Brian. I really appreciate it. And yeah, uh, appreciate thanks it. everyone. It was really an awesome conversation. Um, I really oh. appreciate everyone's uh, participation. Thank you. Lots of great questions. Great dialogue. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great job, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Uh, just so everyone thank knows. Thank you guys from the Scaling Manifesto. It was so exciting that you guys were here. I really appreciate it. That was yeah, fun. Thank you guys. Glad you guys talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, I will be posting this to uh, the Buffalo Agile YouTube group. Um, I'll send a link out eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. So this video should be up there probably tomorrow. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks. And some of you I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye. Thanks.